Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. Who do you think took down the most infamous organized crime boss in New York history? Yes, it was indeed a man who at least did the prosecuting part, but the person that took him down was a woman. One of the first African-American woman lawyers. And that woman would be Eunice Carter. Let's get started. I need to sit up. This chair is comfy, but sometimes, man. Okay, disclaimer, if I mispronounce her name throughout this whole thing as I get into things, I'm sorry, but Eunice is a very unique name. Eunice or Eunice? Hold on. Eunice. Eunice. Eunice should be easy for me to remember, but knowing me, I don't know. Eunice Roberta Hutton Carter was born on July 16, 1899 in Atlanta, Georgia. She was born into a very educated and affluent family. Her parents were both college educated, which was rare in the late 1800s United States. Her father was an international secretary for the YMCA and a founder of the black division of the YMCA, William Alpheus Hutton, and her mother, Addie Waits Hutton, was a social worker. She had a younger brother, W. Alpheus Hutton Jr., who was born on September 18, 1903. He later became an author, academic, and an activist who was very involved in the Council on African Affairs, which was a volunteer organization that was a leading voice for anti-colonialism and pan-Africanism in the United States. W. was a loud promoter of pan-African identity, which is the idea that peoples of African descent have common interests and should be unified. That whole thing alone goes a whole lot deeper, but this is about Eunice. I couldn't find much about her childhood, but what I could find since she was born into this extremely affluent family, it was instilled in her that she had a sense of duty to serve others. When she was about seven years old, her family moved to Brooklyn, New York after the 1906 Atlanta race riot. Very briefly, the 1906 Atlanta race riots was spurred on when a group of black men sexually assaulted four women on the evening of September 22nd, 1906. The violence lasted till September 24th of that same year and was more of a massacre of violence between armed mobs of white Americans against African Americans. I encourage you go look that up. It goes a whole lot deeper than just that. It, I, ugh, it's brutal. Anyway, Eunice and her brother enjoyed a relative privileged upbringing, attending the local schools and their mother even became active with the NAACP and YMCA in Brooklyn. She achieved national status and was elected as one of two women to go to France during World War I to check on the conditions of black servicemen fighting for the United States. So her mother's a badass. <laughs> Jumping ahead here, Eunice graduated from Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts in 1921. She not only graduated in four years, but in those four years earned a bachelor's and a master's degree, which is stupid hard, becoming just the second woman in history to do so. Just be prepared. She gets just a lot more awesome. Like she's really awesome and she's really freaking smart. Her master's was in social work. So it made sense that she went to work in social work. That's a whole lot of work. <laughs> In 1924, she met and married dentist Lyle Carter Sr., who was one of the first African-American dentists in New York. I'm blowing your mind this week, huh? <laughs> a year later, they had their first and only son, Lyle C. Carter Jr. on November 18th, 1925. Eunice worked in the, f in Eunice? Eunice. Eunice. I'm telling you, I, don't, I'm, I, I swear, I must have dys dyslexic or something because I cannot pronounce words. Eunice worked in the social working field when I'm assuming she just got bored and decided to go to law school, because why not? <laughs> I'm bored, I'm gonna go to law school. 
just because I can. She went to Fordham University in New York City. Fordham is a private Jesuit research university. Being 181 years old, it is the oldest Catholic and Jesuit university in the Northeastern United States and the third oldest in New York State. That thing's haunted. So when Eunice graduated from this school in 1932, she was the first black woman <laughs> to receive a law degree from this university. I'm telling you, I'm gonna blow your mind in this story. Then in mid-May of 1933, she passed the New York bar exam, which is hella hard. Then in 1938, Smith College awarded her an honorary doctorate in law. And I'm not even mainly on what she's known for. And she's already a baddie. <sighs> Hair everywhere. Again, if you're just so cool that a, a college just kind of goes, here, just say, stop touching my hair. After she graduated, she started her own private practice, but that was a bit of a struggle, not only for just being a rookie lawyer, but being a woman and a black woman and it being 1930s slash 40s United States. I'm not that smart to be a law lawyer. What? <laughs> A law lawyer. <laughs> I'm not that smart to be a law lawyer, so I can't even imagine the struggle. <laughs> it's a lawyer of the law. <laughs> oh, I entertain myself. It's really fun. <laughs> With the fight of getting her practice off the ground a complete struggle, she wound up being a volunteer assistant in New York City's women's courts. Her career took an uptick when in 1934, she accepted the Republican nomination for a state assembly seat. Though she lost that election, her fiery talent was seen by Mayor Forelia Lay LaGuardia. Remember him? And his state special prosecutor, Thomas E. Dewey. You'll learn more about him in a minute. They had hired a large staff to fight organized crime and they loved Eunice's talents enough that in the spring of 1935, she was appointed to predominantly work on conditions in the black areas of Harlem, literally called the Commission on Conditions in Harlem very imaginative. In that same year, Dewey appointed her to be his assistant. Thus, Eunice became the first female African-American assistant district attorney in New York State, baby. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about her boss for a minute. Thomas E. Dewey, or we're just gonna call him Dewey. Before being a special prosecutor, he was chief assistant U.S. attorney and had made a reputation for taking down big organized crime names. He had won the conviction against New York bootlegger Waxy Gordon in 1933, and in 1935 was the prosecutor of mobster Dutch Schultz and crippled his operations. So he was perfect to be special prosecutor for 19. 40s mob haven of New York City. Uh, yeah, New York City was a mob's haven. Ever seen Godfather? To crack down on mob activity, Dewey formed the 20 Against the Underworld. It was when putting together this team that he put Eunice on his team. She would be the only black and female lawyer on the team. Wow. Though her being named to the team drew the most attention, her day-to-day -day responsibilities showed that she was at the bottom of the group pecking order. Investigating these cases, she found something interesting. Now, pay attention here, okay? She saw that the women arrested for prostitution all over New York City were represented by the same lawyers and bail bondsmen. And those people had a relationship with someone called Charlie Lucky Luciano. And we'll get into who he is in a minute. Now, how she saw this pattern was that due to her day-to-day -day responsibilities, though low on the totem pole would prove to be a massive breakthrough. You see, Dewey had solicited the help of New Yorkers for information on illicit activities and all of the calls, letters, and in-person specifically related to prostitution were directed to Eunice. Now, 
Dewey was not interested in going this particular angle in part because he feared being seen as a moral crusader. And that fear stemmed from because whether you like it or not, prostitution and sex work is the oldest profession in the world. So seeing this pattern, Eunice thought that this cast of hoodlums, I love that word, perhaps controlled New York's prostitution as a racket. A racket is another way to describe a scheme or an illegitimate enterprise that works by bribery and or intimidation. With this theory that became even more plausible to her when she saw another pattern from the numerous complaints about very specific brothels that were being ignored by police, she went to Dewey. He must have thought her theory was interesting enough because he opened an investigation by his office into her theory. And her theory was fully confirmed. Racketeers, who was someone that does fraudulent business dealings, were indeed deeply in illegal prostitution and was collecting 50% of their employees' earnings. All right. Let's talk about Charles Lucky Luciano. And we're gonna talk about him because he is of massive importance in this story. Charles was born Salvatore Luciana in Sicily, Italy on November 14th, 1897. In 1906, his family moved to the United States, not able to speak a word of English. He, of course, struggled in school. This is where he learned how to rack it. <laughs> by getting his schoolmates to pay him for protection. <laughs> Honestly, that's kind of smart because if some guy came up to me not speaking a word of English and essentially told me to leave somebody alone, I'm gonna leave them alone. <laughs> and if the person that they were paying him to protect them didn't cough up the money, just gonna say it, he beat them up. With this, he quickly got a reputation when he dropped out of school in 1914 for being a gangster and started a career in the Five Points Gang, which was a street gang composed mainly of Irish Americans. He got his nickname Lucky when he survived an abduction and attack by a group of men that beat him, stabbed him, and left him for dead on a beach on Staten Island. He somehow survived, don't know how, got revenge on the mob boss that wanted him dead by helping arrange to get his mob people to kill him. The ways of the mob. <laughs> He rose to power after taking out his biggest rival, Marzano, in 1931 and became the boss of that mob. Lucky sought to create a national organized crime network and was able to bring in some big names into his national crime syndicate, including Chicago's Al Capone. And we all know who that is. Good God, we all know who Al Capone is. This syndicate was also known as the Commission, and it brought in New York City's five largest organized crime families, Maranzano, Profauci, Mangano, Luciano, and Galigano. If I mispronounced those, I'm so sorry. And Lucky is considered to be the father of modern organized crime in the United States. He became hella wealthy through the mob's dealings in loan sharking, drug dealing, lotteries, prostitution, and other illegal activities, all while keeping his name out of the headlines. But his luck ran out when Eunice saw his prostitution racketeer pattern. With this confirmation on Eunice's theory, Dewey went into action, and by January of 1936, the wiretaps were starting to pay off. Through the taps, they were able to acquire names of gangsters linked to Luciano. With all investigations, Eunice and fellow prosecutor Murray Griffin were worried about a possible leak in the chain of command of Luciano's mob, and they persuaded Dewey to go into action faster. And on February 1st, 1936, Eunice, her herself oversaw the raid of dozens of brothels all throughout Manhattan and New York and arrested 100 illegal sex workers and 10 men. The detained women played the shyness card in regarding of any knowledge of mob involvement. But when the usual bondsmen didn't show up to help them with the $10,000 for bail each, because the bail bondsmen had been arrested too, about several changed their tone and confessed about other main figures in the racket. 
Eunice played her part very well in getting information from the sex workers as well. She got many of them to trust her and even got Madam Sally Kaplan, AKA Red Sadie, which is a really cool name to say it, to give up the names of Luciano's henchmen, Dave Miller and Jimmy Fredericks. And three of the sex workers implicated Luciano himself as the ringleader and that his associate, David Bellito, was in charge of the New York City prostitution ring. They also mentioned that any money Luciano got came from Dave. But this information came a little bit too late by the time Dewey wanted to indict Luciano because Luciano got the hell out of New York in late March after being tipped off. But soon he was, ow, that hurt. But soon he was found and arrested on April 3rd, 1963 in Hot Springs, Arkansas and escorted back home to stand trial where he was indicted in New York on 60 counts of compulsory prostitution. Interestingly, from my research, <laughs> on April 6th, Oe Madden, a one-time owner of the Cotton Club, offered a bribe of $50,000 to Arkansas Attorney General Carly E. Bailey to aid in Luciano's case. <laughs> Luckily, he refused the bribery and reported it immediately. Just something unique I found. <laughs> Even though Eunice was basically the reason Luciano and his mob were caught, she was not selected to assist Dewey in the court case, but she did remain involved by helping prepare witnesses and overseeing the protection of the women that agreed to take the stand. Lasting from May 13th to June 7th, the case was heard at the police fortified Manhattan courthouse and became a media sensation and was dubbed the trial of the century. Which quick side note, why do we call so many court cases that. Like, of course, there are a few that are truly trials of the century, but why is almost everything called that? I don't get it. I'm not gonna rant about it, but it just confuses me. <laughs> if you're wondering what Luciano's defense was, he said he was not directly linked to the brothels. Basically, it wasn't me. You saw the marks on my shoulder. It wasn't me. Heard the words that I told her. It wasn't me. <laughs> Ultimately, it was the brave and compelling testimonies of the several prostitutes that swayed the jury to convict him guilty on all counts and was given 30 to 50 years and was sent to the Clinton Correctional Facility in Denimura, New York, which interestingly is nicknamed Siberia for being near the Canadian border. Another interesting thing I found, after using his criminal connections in Italy to help the Allies in World War II, he received parole in 1946 and was deported back to Italy where he spent the rest of his life. Amazing. <laughs> Luciano's conviction based solely on Eunice's theory is considered one of the most successful court actions against organized crime in US history. <laughs> it put a big dent in Luciano's syndicate's illicit activities and political corruption. Because of course it wouldn't be the mob without political corruption. The conviction was described by Luciano's biographer, Tim Newark, as quote, a landmark in legal history as it was the first against a major organized crime figure for anything other than tax evasion. Because if you know, anytime the mob has been taken down, it's always for tax evasion. So Eunice's finding of specifically prostitution was never done. I'm telling you, this lady is really freaking smart. After the successful prosecution, she earned the title Lady Racket Buster. I love that. Dewey gained a forever and genuine respect for her and her prosecuting skills. Eunice even frequently accompanied him to political events in many places, including Harlem. She continued to serve as Dewey's assistant district attorney of New York County for the next 10 years, where she was the leader of the Abandonment Bureau of Women's Court. And in 1937, he assigned her to be head of his special Sessing Bureau that involved cases brought to municipal court. She had that position until 1945. In 1946, she left the prosecutor's office and public employment and went into private practice. 
She connected her work with black run organizations like the National Council of Negro Women, became a legal advisor for the newly formed United Nations, yeah, as well as served on the executive committee of the International Council of Women that has representatives from 37 countries, served on the board of the YWCA or Young Women's Christian Association, and in 1955 was elected to chair the International Conference of Non-Governmental Organizations. This chick did a lot. <laughs> Eunice Carter died on January 25th, 1970 at the age of 70. Her son went on to follow in his mother's footsteps. He graduated from college and law school and practiced law. He later worked in the John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson administrations as a political appointee. He got married and had five children. One of them, Stephen L. Carter, became an author and a Yale law professor. Her brain runs deep in the family. In 2018, he published a book about his grandmother called Invisible, the forgotten story of the black woman lawyer who took down America's most powerful mobster. Though she's not as well known as Luciano, her story did inspire a character on HBO's groundbreaking badass series, Boardwalk Empire. Okay, that was the truly nutso story of Eunice Carter, the black woman behind the scenes that brought the country's most powerful crime boss to his knees. Actually, a friend told me about her story. And the more that I dug into it, the more I'm like, this lady's awesome. I must talk about her. We all must learn about her. So thank you, friend. <laughs> if you learned something today, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. And while you're down there, please leave a friendly comment. I will be back next week with another video. And until then, don't be well behaved. You just might make history. See you next time, guys.